Thank you. Um, so hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming along this afternoon. Uh, my name's Laura, and I'm a product engineer at Intercom. My Twitter is at Willslaw. Um, and I'm going to be talking to you today about how we can set junior developers up for success. So in the last few years, there's been a huge change in what backgrounds that junior developers are coming from. It's no longer strictly computer science graduates. It's not even necessarily STEM graduates. Um, there are now tons of resources online through services like Udemy, Pluralsight, Stack Overflow, where people can teach themselves how to code um, in their free time. And there are now even coding boot camps, jam-packed courses which are promising to get you a job as a junior developer in a matter of months. And these are springing up left, right, and center across the globe. So this subject is actually quite close to my heart because I also entered software development through one of these unconventional backgrounds. Um, so let's step back quickly and rewind to three years ago when I worked in a very different industry. Um, I used to work in an investment bank as a commodities trader. And I left because no matter what lens I looked through, I couldn't see a future for myself in the industry. There was, my job was in no way related to programming at all, and I knew zero code. In fact, I thought I'd kind of missed the boat on learning how to code until I signed up for Makers Academy, um, which is one of these so-called boot camps. And I spent four months learning how to code and how to work in an agile environment with a cohort of other career changers, entrepreneurs, and graduates. Um, and looking back on my time since graduating from the course, I've worked for three different companies in developer roles. And some of the experiences I've had just make me giddy with excitement when I talk about them. Um, but there have also been times when I've been super frustrated by the working environment and felt blocked by the culture. Um, and it saddens me to know that I'm not the only one that sometimes feels this way. Um, because when you've invested like, all that time and effort in switching your career, you want to believe that it was worth it. Um, and rather selfishly, I want people who commit to this kind of career change to end up loving what they do and to really be able to see themselves carving out a future in tech. Um, and in particular, I feel this for the students that I coach within an organization called Codebar. Um, so Codebar is, um, runs evening workshops um, for free for people from underrepresented backgrounds um, in tech and helps them to learn programming skills. And pretty much all of the people who attend as students have full-time jobs, have worked a full day before coming to Code Bar to spend another two and a half hours learning to code. And a lot of them will attend weekly over the course of months or even a couple of years to build up their skills until they're confident enough to start applying for junior developer roles. Um, so we have this huge number of super enthusiastic junior developers um, that are coming out of university, boot camps, programs like Codebar, who are really eager to begin a career in tech. Um, and this isn't a problem. This is actually wonderful. Um, but the problem is that not all companies are doing a very good job of translating that energy, that excitement, and enthusiastic, uh, enthusiasm into rocket fuel, which can really help them succeed. Um, and I know this from my own personal experience and from anecdotal evidence from my peers. Um, but some companies are doing a brilliant job. So what is it about these companies, the ones that seem to get it right, that makes them what they are? And how can others improve? Um, so today, what I want to share with you is kind of what I think the fundamental areas are that we can work on to ensure that junior developers aren't set up to fail. Much of this will be informed by my own experiences, um, both the positive and the negative ones, um, from the three companies I've worked at since starting my career in tech. Um, and we'll look at where things have gone well, where there's perhaps been some room for improvement, and at the end, I'll leave some time for Q&A and discussion. So now onto what I believe will help set your junior developers up for success. Firstly, I think it should be easy to ask for help. This is kind of a given. I've never met anyone who would say it should be otherwise. Um, and we hear things like this a lot, like there are no stupid questions. But saying something like this doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to be any easier to ask, for question, ask questions or for, to ask for help. And it certainly isn't always going to translate into more questions asked. But let's think about some of the reasons why a junior developer might not be asking questions. They fear they'll look stupid. They don't want to appear to need help. 
They don't want to waste other people's time. Um, the list kind of goes on, and much of it boils down to what we know as imposter syndrome. Um, I won't get into this too much right now because it's a whole other talk in itself. Um, but for those of you that haven't come across the term before, it's a psychological phenomenon. And it's when you believe that you're inadequate, incompetent, or a failure, contrary to evidence that shows that that's completely untrue, evidence that shows that you're quite skilled and successful. Um, and it can be really harmful to an individual's well-being and development. Um, and the effect of it can definitely be mitigated, as well as being made worse, often unintentionally. And the story I'm about to tell you is an example of the latter. So very early on um, in a role that I had prior to joining Intercom, I was working in React. And in the React community, there is a lot of noise over what's the best thing to do, like what, what's the best way to do something, um, what are the best patterns to use, what libraries you should be including in your app. Um, and so after working in the code base for a few days, I was curious about some of the reasoning for some of the patterns that were used in the app. And I decided to get one of the senior developers' opinions on it. But instead of opening up a discussion, like I hoped, I was quickly dismissed and sent a Medium article to read. And that experience left me with a little bit of a bad taste. Aside from the fact that the article wasn't even that relevant to the discussion, the message I received was very much, these decisions aren't up for discussion. Please don't disturb me. Everything we read on Medium is true. And I mean, don't get me wrong, there is some great content online. Um, and often, sharing reading materials can be far more valuable and effective than trying to commu communicate an idea yourself. Um, and it probably was never that developer's intention to make me feel that way, but it did. And these events became more than one-offs. And at the time, I was still very new to the team, and I didn't really feel that empowered to give feedback. Um, so like what the result was, I became reluctant to ask questions and be curious about the work I was doing. Um, from my perspective, it felt like I was a waste of other people's time. And the tone that that set was very difficult to undo. So how could that have gone better? Well, let's contrast that story with this one. A few weeks ago, I was working on a task that required some database setup and migrations. And as someone with largely front-end experience, I had zero clue what I was doing. Um, and so I said this to the senior developer on the team. And his response was, nor do I. Shall we pair on it? Now, he could have easily turned around and said, here's a previous pull request by someone else. It's a perfect example of everything you need to do, just with a different name. You go do it. But he didn't. And he acknowledged that he didn't know either, which immediately set a tone of, it's OK to not have the answers. And if you have questions or if you ask for help, people will do, the best, do their best to help you too. And it's in these early interactions that I believe the paths of success and failure start to diverge. One scenario is reinforcing the feelings of imposter syndrome, which is unproductive and harmful. And the other is more empathetic. And the outcome of it was that both of us learned something new from it. So the next level beyond that is being comfortable asking questions. So the next level beyond being um, able to ask questions um, is also being comfortable trying out new things and taking risks. Um, so that brings me on to my second point, which is having safe to fail environments. This is important for all levels, not just juniors in my opinion, but juniors are in particular at a point in their career where they are learning a lot and are undoubtedly going to trip up at some point. So being scared of making a mistake is only going to slow that learning process down. Um, the trouble is, it's really hard work to create, and it's also hard to keep up a safe-to-fail culture. Um, it's so much easier to avoid taking risks and blame mistakes on somebody else. Um, but these are the reasons that I left my career in banking, and they're certainly not the reasons why I decided to pursue a career in tech. Um, so kind of how can we address this? I think we can look at it from two angles. The first is related to people and culture. Um, so we need to get rid of blame cultures. We shouldn't be spending time focusing on mistakes and shirking responsibility, but we should be striving to move forward and learn from them, which I appreciate is sometimes easier said than done. Um, but getting rid of blame cultures won't solve the whole problem, though. 
there's a bit of a tension um, between embracing learning from failure to create new value and protecting against failure which damages existing value. Um, and in one of the previous companies that I worked for, we went through a spell of kind of sitting in the middle of this tension. Um, for one of the projects that we were working on, the expectations of the impact of the project grew massively all of a sudden. And as a team, we very quickly lost that sense of it being safe to fail because the risks were all of a sudden so much greater. Um, and the result universally was that it felt very antithetical to what we thought our company culture was. Um, and people started to feel stressed and anxious rather than challenged and excited. Um, and it's difficult to know exactly what the best action to take here would have been. Um, but, and so I'd be really open to kind of hearing feedback in our question and answer session later. Um, but that is where I think processes can help us. Things like automated testing, alarming, keeping production time, time to production low, um, all can all help. And here's how. So when you have the right automated tests in place, the likelihood of things like randomly breaking like, becomes less. And if something does go wrong, like having the right alarming in place and knowing you can deploy a fix in 15 minutes because you've made an effort to keep your time to production low, you can start to build up your faith in these systems because getting because the unknown is then just getting to the bottom of that bug. Um, even encouraging smaller PRs is helpful because they're easier to understand and review, and it's harder for avoidable mistakes to get lost in the noise of all the different changes. So all of these kind of seemingly small factors can reduce the overall fear of failing. And once we have this kind of working culture, it becomes a lot easier to address the third point, which is providing opportunities for growth. Um, so I've got another story, um, which I think would, which I think kind of demonstrates this, the impact of this quite well. So in my very first developer role, I was really fortunate in that when I joined, we were about to embark on a pretty big new feature in our app. Um, in one of our initial planning sessions, about two or three weeks in, the lead developer on the team suggested that I take on the task of building out the front end for one of our mobile apps. And my little reaction was like <laughs> this. <laughs> I was freaking out on the inside. Because um, up until this point, I'd done most of my programming in Ruby and Ruby on Rails and very limited amounts of JavaScript. And here, there was this super cool opportunity for me building out a new feature but it was also a very limited amount of time to get to grips with working um, with a front-end framework, um, as well as actually delivering the thing. Um, so initially, it felt like a very insurmountable task. But in the end, it wasn't. And I could have utterly tanked, but I didn't. Um, and I think as a team, we all agreed that it was probably one of our most successful projects that we ever had. Um, so how did we go from me being intimidated um, and worried to it being a success? And actually, it kind of builds on the first two points, because it was easy to ask questions, and it was OK to experiment. Tripping up and picking myself back up again was all part of the process. Um, I had a ton of support from the team. There were a lot of whiteboarding sessions to help me understand the React ecosystem and the technical architecture of what we were building. Um, a lot of the work was done while pairing with other engineers, which enabled me to upskill, um, while also kind of making a meaningful contribution to the team. Um, and getting to work on something so impactful so early in my time really demonstrated certain, like, some of the team values, things that, like ownership and investing in each other. And that set the tone for the rest of my time with the company. Throughout subsequent projects, I felt reassured by my team because the actions were there to back up the words. And each of us were able to uphold these values. Um, so that initial bet they took on me paid off because I became a much more confident developer as a result of it. Um, so the learning there is that you shouldn't be afraid to take a bet. Um, I'm forever grateful for that opportunity and to that teammate for taking a bet on me. Um, 
I became a much more confident developer as a result of it, and like I am going to try and like replicate that for any future junior developers that kind of join my team when I'm in that position too. Um, but what you've probably noticed by now is that there isn't really a fix all magic solution to like ensuring that junior developers become successful. Um, but what I will draw your attention to is that all of these stories that I'm sharing with you happened very early on in my time at the companies I worked for. So that brings me on to developer onboarding. Developer onboarding in a lot of companies is a matter of getting set up on your laptop and meeting the team. Um, it includes, but like, it should include introducing new team members to your values, your ways of working, and teaching your company culture. Much in the way that you can build a great product that's actually of no use to anyone because they never make it past those onboarding stages, you can hire great junior developers who will fail to real realize their potential because they were never successfully onboarded. Um, and the great thing about a good onboarding experience is that it will propagate throughout your organization as people continue to share the same experiences and values um, with future new joiners. Um, so I'm currently eight weeks into the um, process of being onboarded at Intercom. And a lot of thought has already gone into the process there. Um, we have a Trello board that acts as a guide for what each of your first few weeks should look like. Um, and on it, you're encouraged to do certain things that will help you learn the Intercom culture and way of working. For example, shipping to production in your first few days, asking for a systems um, and product overviews from different teammates, presenting what you've worked on to the team um, are all cards on the board. Even giving feedback on the process is a suggested task. And what I found is that it's guided me through overcoming that initial imposter syndrome phase and helped me get comfortable asking lots of questions, encouraged me to seek out opportunities for growth. And even though it's still very early days, I'm quite confident that it makes a big difference. Um, so if you haven't considered your onboarding experience before, start small. Um, get some initial feedback on what's gone well and where new joiners have struggled, um, and then iterate and apply the same principles that we do to product development to developer onboarding. Um, the weak spots that need to be addressed will be unique to every company. Um, but ensuring that it's easy to ask for help, it's OK to make mistakes, and that everyone has opportunities for growth, um, and those messages clearly come across in developer onboarding, will get you the majority of the way there. Um, so that's all I have for you today. Um, thank you very much for listening.